show, you guys don't realize that we actually see it on our blazers like that. It doesn't creep up. How are you? I'm all right. Yourselves? Good, good, thank you. How's yeah. everybody in the room? Good, good. 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 Yeah. Cool, cool. So we're very excited to see you today. I know I've been watching Dragon's Den for a while. I'm sure everyone here has seen you on it. Uh, so I have a couple questions to start us off. Uh, tell me a bit about your story. I know you started off working in your dad's cinema. That's where it all started. Now you're at 141 screens or more across Quebec. How did that happen? Uh, so first of all, I, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, when I was young, I, so my dad's a machinist. He was a machinist at Pratt & Whitney uh, during the 70s, and so during the uh, union strikes, he thought he needed something to stabilize revenue, so he bought an Italian sports bar. So anybody who's Italian or Greek, you know what I'm talking about, everybody else, Google it. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so the problem with bars is that they go till three in the morning. Uh, and so he wanted to buy a cafeteria. So for those of you who don't know this, I could have been the king of cafeterias. Uh, but no, my dad decided he was gonna buy a movie theater because it was cheaper than buying a cafeteria. Um, and how hard could it be? So growing up, I saw my dad go through the entrepreneurial journey. And God knows, I didn't want that. I didn't want the stress, I didn't want the 17%. 20% interest rates uh, in the 80s. I didn't want you know, some American guy saying, who are you again and why, do you, why should I give you my movies? This was in Tampa? No, 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 our first theaters that we owned was actually a little cinema uh, called Cinema Paradis okay. in the East End of Montreal. Okay. Right? And so you can imagine that growing up, I'm only child, you know, I, you know, I see my dad worry, see the anxiety, it wasn't my thing. And my dad would tell me from a young age, you gotta be a lawyer. Okay. Okay, so I went to law school. I actually went to economics at Western, went to law school. And so my plan was to be Harvey Specter. Yes. From Suits. That's <laughs> sure. Right? So I was headed for New York. That was the plan. I don't know nothing about movie theaters, nothing about entrepreneurial. You were all crazy for wanting to be entrepreneurs, kind of approach, right? It's a great start. Yeah. Right? <laughs> really encouraging. And then my dad said, look, you're an only job. We own a few theaters. Can you give me a year to prove to you that it's a business worth being in? Okay. I got a year to give you, no problem. And I, lit, I, I litigated so much during that first six months that I actually stayed just to beat up on the American studios. The studios give movies and they get a role. And the more movie theaters they give it to, the better it is. The problem is the movie exhibitor says, well, if you give me the movie and give the guy across the street the movie, well then I'm, I'm only gonna play your good movies, not your bad movies. The studios have more bad movies than they do have good movies. The investments are already been paid, they gotta get a return on their investment, so you're tight selling now. Right now my lawyer is coming out. So you're tight selling, creating barriers to entry, and you're willfully allowing to be a hostage to two conglomerates who are splitting up the market. Right, right. So in 1998, for those of you who are old enough to remember that one, 1998, I opened the theater in the West Island of Montreal in DDO and Sources, and we lodged a complaint with the Antitrust, uh, uh, with the Competition Bureau of Canada, and so ensued a, a fight. The fight, and that's where the, um, you guys come in. The fight was so fun okay. that I realized I didn't have to go to New York to get into fights. I can get into fights in Montreal. I get into fights with guys from Toronto, and guys from LA, from Montreal, and I could live at home and not have to pay uh, crazy rent. Crazy rent. <laughs> yeah. So that's how the entrepreneurial journey really started. To be honest with you, it was by mistake. Right. But as you get into it, so let me make a quick parallel. Who works out here? Anybody? I mean, everybody's going to raise their hands, but who really works out? Here? Like on a regular basis, right? Okay, you know when you're working out and, and your muscles start burning and it starts hurting and, and you're saying, yeah, yeah, and everybody's looking at you saying, what a weirdo. Okay, that pain, the, the pain okay. is the addiction, is what you're going to fall in love with as an entrepreneur. You're gonna, you're gonna fight. So the best thing that can happen to me when I want to do a project is somebody like Arlene Dickinson. Yes, the challenge. She, she, no, she leans over and says, 
It won't work. You can't do that. <laughs> it's all over. I'm 210 percent in, and it's going to work. That's what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is somebody who's willing not to fit in the rules and regulations. So a lot of people think I was an entrepreneur from a very young age. Why? Because I dress differently, I behave differently, I didn't really like conventional rules. So I had everything to be an entrepreneur. But I had one thing, I had a father who suffered in the entrepreneurial journey. And he retired early from the entrepreneurial journey. And in fact, today, I had to have a 20 minute discussion with my mom. We're finalizing a huge transaction. And my mom says to me, so you're gonna settle down now? Are you done? Are you done? Yeah, yeah. You, done? you have enough now? Yeah. yeah. What are you talking about? She's wrong. Well, your dad retired at 51, 52. Okay, but, and now he's miserable ever since. So I wanna continue working. That's what you need to realize. That as entrepreneurs, nobody will understand. So realize that. Realize that you will be misunderstood. So tell me more about that. So was it the challenge initially that made you realize this or was it seeing your dad? Because you mentioned seeing him you know, through the stresses and all of that, but you still went through, after your law degree, you went through that path. Well, I went, Now, how, how do you see that? Do you, would you recommend someone go into entrepreneurship? So now I tell you like this. I tell you, and my wife has to live with this. I tell you that when things are calm, I don't feel it. You know that you know that saying, the calm before the storm? Right. So when things are calm, that's when I'm the most anxious. That's when I'm the most, something's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? Anticipate. And I'm just trying to figure. So yesterday, for example, you know, I, I get into the office, and while, we're, like I said, working on this big uh, closing uh, deal, I look at one of my emails, and I got an email from one of the studios, uh, with one of their periodical audits to validate, you know, admissions and so forth and so forth. Okay. When my when my VP film saw it, it was oh, oh, it's not it's amazing. And I'm coming to the office, we're gonna beat up on them, we're gonna explain to them how they're morons and they don't even know how to do the calculations right. Sure. It's the best thing they can do. It's, it's, I mean, there's nothing I enjoy more than beating up on on these guys. And then he says, I know they're gonna come after us for the cost score. Great, we'll call the competition bureau in, we'll call the uh, Action Consumatar, we'll get a big lawsuit going against them. And the whole office is saying, this freaking guy's crazy, and <laughs> like he wants to go to war. But guys, I want you to realize, for two years, I was bored to death. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, so it's very important that you realize that being an entrepreneur is a journey. And this is gonna, I'm happy you said it in the voice, in, in the text, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a journey, you're gonna cross tons of people in this journey. Some will come, some will go, some will come back. But it's your journey. And there's nothing that I can say to scare you, because I don't wanna scare you. But what I do wanna tell you is, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, everybody wants to be successful. And if we create a parallel between success and a pyramid, what happens when you climb up a pyramid? There's less and less room at every level sure. for people to be with you. Yeah. Yeah. That means you're going to have less and less people that are going to understand what you're going through. Right? And... The other warning I can tell you as an entrepreneur is you can't be everything to everybody. Don't try and be a successful entrepreneur, an amazing husband or wife, an amazing brother or sister, can't do it. or an amazing parent or whatever. Read autobiographies and you'll realize most of the people that you guys are looking up to are dysfunctional. <laughs> they are. So can you tell me a bit more? So with that pyramid example. Yeah. Who, who was your support network, let's say, in the middle of this, when you were you know, in those challenges and you felt like no one could understand you? Who would you go to to speak these things and to me. get that support? Yourself. Me. You talk to yourself? All the time. Okay. To the point that my wife, my wife went to get a, uh, 
a PhD in psychology to try and, <laughs> and diagnose me as, as, as bipolar or, or, or split personality or something. Okay. But the truth of the matter is, you're alone in it. So, so I want you to understand, I mean, it's very important, is that we're not, sometimes, remember, somebody says something, the media picks it up, transforms it, then, it, then the communications guys get in and everybody, Give us the context. Well, yeah. they, yeah. you know, they put a nice yellow flower and everything. Sure. Sure. It's beautiful. But when, so I met Steve Jobs. Okay. I met him many, many years ago, uh, probably a few years before he fell severely sick. Uh, Where was it? it? It was in LA. Okay. Uh, so before Marvel bought Disney, et cetera, sure. Et cetera, sure, sure, sure. Well, Apple had more money than God. <laughs> And Apple was looking at buying into the movie industry and they wanted to buy a studio. And their pick a choice was this. So, so you know, we met under that, uh, those circumstances, we talked about it. And he had said to me, it's funny the way people take what I say, but don't realize what I'm saying, right? So you used one of the slogan, one, one of the quotes he yeah. says, which yeah. is, uh, which was what life's dogma. Decide by yourself what you want to do. Yeah, but life's too short, don't live somebody else's life. Right, right, right. When he said that, and, and I said, well, what were you trying to say? Oh, you're asking him? Yeah, no, no, because no, he said, so he, he, was, he was giving me examples okay. of how he was being misquoted. That's true. Oh, he brought that one. Okay. Because okay. I'm trying to tell people, ask questions. And they understand that I'm saying, Disobey common figure it out. You know. So, and this is something I repeat now often because he has said it to me, and because of the two years in COVID, it's been very important. And because you guys are the right age to understand. Ask questions. Ask the question. What do you what do you mean? Challenge the people who come out with the slogans, with the quotes. As an entrepreneur, you'll learn that you you will have to surmount the challenges. Go see a banker and say, I need a million dollars. For what? To build this. Why? How are you going to pay me back? What are you going to do? Why don't you? And then some of them are going to say, Why don't you do it this way? Don't get offended. Don't get mad at it. Don't tell them, eh, Why are you telling me what to do? Like, you know, just understand that he's challenging you to see if you have the answer. You, as entrepreneur, need to learn to challenge your team. Right? I want you to understand when Steve Jobs came up with the idea of a cell phone, it was very simple. He walked into a room and said, Apple's going into the cell phone business. Yeah, yeah, and all the engineers, yeah, I want a cell phone, I want a phone with no buttons. What? <laughs> and, and he told us, you have to see my engineers, it was so funny. What were you talking about? No buttons. No buttons. How am I supposed to remember? Voice recognition, all of that stuff was invented after, right? So he basically said, then, then I really think they could come up with a phone with no buttons? I don't have the slightest idea. But I challenged them. I pushed to them. And that's what you are as entrepreneurs. You're people who will push the limit. And so the, the, get used to challenging. Because by challenging, you'll learn the skills to challenge. You will be challenged in return as entrepreneurs. Right. And you'll know. You'll know how to do that. That's right. So, so tell me a bit about Dragon's End. You say a lot about you invest in the people before the ventures. People are really important to them. How do you challenge them there? How do you see if you know that one pitch or that one entrepreneur has that ability or is, has that you know inquisitiveness, resourcefulness? Well, so first of all, you know that what you see on TV is an edited version, edited version of hypercut. Well, yeah, it's sort of forty-five minutes to an hour pitch. Okay. And you see what I would say the best moments when they're sure. not reporting what Arlene's saying. Those are the best moments. Right. Uh, the secret is we have an hour, but we don't know anything about your company, right? So if you were to come to Dragon's Den, what happens is um, Kevin, who's the stage, uh, stage head, comes in and says, uh, he'll say, uh, Nabil, okay? Nabil's from Montreal, okay? And then I'll tease him and pretend that. I don't know how to spell it. I say, can you spell it for me? <laughs> and how do you spell Montreal again? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so, so we start off. So we know nothing okay. about you. You walk in, you say what you want. 
What we're doing there on a certain point is trying to challenge you on what you're telling. So let's get something clear. We know, when you come to Dragon's Head, we know you've asked your mom for the money. She said no. You asked for you know, your girlfriend for the money. She said no. You probably went to a bank and they said, there's a reason you're there. There's That's a reason. Okay, so, okay. And so now we're there and we're saying, okay, how humble can this person be? Okay. How honest will this person be? And could this person survive under pressure? Okay. And the pressure comes from all over the place. And you'll notice, it almost looks like sometimes we're doing it on purpose, but we're not. In a sense, it'll happen that I like a deal, and I'll say, you guys are being so hard on the guy. Or, and then all of a sudden, Arlene or somebody else says, oh, you're, you're, you're. and vice versa. Right. Arlene starts crying and goes, oh my God, it's a beautiful story. I say, shut up. Come on, let's get to something serious, right? <laughs> all of this is because we each have a different personality. We are all looking for different things in different entrepreneurs. Michelle, for example, looks for a lot of what I'm looking for. Okay. But in the fintech space, in the tech space, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So then we also have our <coughs> own uh, uh, love industries, right? So I love the, for the portfolio, space. right? That's right, for okay. the portfolio. Okay. I love the food space. It's easy for me to bring in a food product because I just put it in with the rest of the Sunshine brand or the other brands I have, Good Pantry or whatever. And, and it's all, it's an easy, cheap way of branding a whole team together versus I'm gonna go into the, uh, in the, in the tech space, uh, not my thing necessarily, right? So we're looking for the person because at the end of the day, guys, let's be honest, the product is secondary. If you're good, if you're really a good person that we want to partner up with, don't worry about it. Once we sell off that company, Fine. I'll give you two other companies we can work on together and make money. So, so tell me about Brandon. You, you mentioned it a lot. You obviously have your own personal brand that's huge. Um, tell me about that. How, how do you look at that when you see a company that comes up to you? So how important is branding, right? Look at it this way. What made branding Huge are companies like Apple, companies like Uber, where a name with negative cash flow, negative EBITDA, was worth ten billion dollars. Right. And I'm sitting there and going, I, I don't, I, I don't get it. Not understand. Why? Do you know how many emails they have? I don't care because I don't check. I get seven thousand emails a day. If you think I go through 7,000 emails, you're offering me a dollar. He's very quiet. I will say he replies very quickly. Right. Right. Text messages. <laughs> Text messages. Yes. Right. Well. And so when I realized that it's all about, um, because of the way society evolved, it's the perception of wealth. It's the perception of success. It's the perception you need this problem. Right? So think about how many times you want something. You feel you need that something, but you never thought about it. Somebody else put it on a piece of paper, or put it in an app, or put it somewhere, and told you, how could you live without having an Uber account and ordering food in? What do you mean? I could actually call a delivery, a company like St. Hubert who has a delivery system. No, 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 you can, you can, you can watch Netflix with cinema groups or popcorn. Because why would you want to watch Netflix without Cinema Goose Pop? So you need to have an Uber account to order the popcorn. No, I don't. Yes, you do. And you're being brainwashed. And it's all because of the brand. And ultimately, what happens is these huge portfolios decide to buy. And what are they buying? They're buying the brand. Right? So if you look at the production of jeans. You may not know this, but in the fashion industry, I'd say 50% of the jeans that you're buying are produced by exactly the same factories, and they're owned by exactly the same investment firm. But the problem is they need to create an illusion of competition, and they need to convince these people, that's what you want, those people, that's what you want. And I said it once, when I opened the Sphere Tech Theater, it's the first time, by the way, when I opened that theater that I did a TV ad. 
Okay. When I go back and look at that TV, I go, man, if times changed, I was so stiff. Were you speaking? Yeah, you were. I was stiff as hell because the theater wasn't finished yet. We couldn't have any visual on the inside of the theater. So I said, hi, you may not know me, but you know my theater. It, it was like, wow, man. I, and, like, I gotta, and that's when I realized how hard it was to be an actor. But in the process, the slogan was, you asked for it, we're giving it to you. And so you, you convinced them that they had asked. Well, no, but the whole idea was in my office when we came up with that slogan. We all looked at each other. Did anybody get an email or something that somebody asked for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you are, and everybody then would say, "Hey, you know how long it is? We were waiting for a theater in that area." Well, how come nobody told us, right? So you need to understand that the brand, the perception of the brand, is more important, right? So I'm gonna. I'm going to close the, that part off like this. In the fashion business, so I had a horrible deal that I did in, in, on Dragon's Den. Uh, I did a deal, it was for, we'll call it Lululemon kind of stuff with Native Art. Okay. The problem that I had there was the entrepreneur had an amazing story, the product was amazing. I had Native partners here in Montreal that were going to help me with the brand. It was amazing. The problem is the entrepreneur did not understand that fashion is about a dream, right? So I've weighed in my life up to 320 pounds. I now weigh 200 pounds. That's almost half of me or a third of me that's no longer here. When Giorgio Armani designed the suits for American Jiggle, he used that movie as a platform that made men believe that if they wore those suits, they could be that character. So when, when I bought my first Armani suit, I weighed 300 pounds. There's not one chance in hell that that suit was gonna look as good as it looked on Richard Gere. Like, not gonna happen. I'm not even as tall as Richard Gere. Not as skinny as him, but the marketing was such Major move. that it made me dream. That's what the brand does, it makes you dream. Why do you go to a George Armani hotel? It's because of the dream, the brand. The, 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 and that's worth money. That's what yeah. anybody who's in accounting, and that's what's called goodwill, and your bank will give you absolutely nothing for it. But the stock market will pay you big bucks for it. Because you've created a brand recognition, a name that people know, right? And, 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 and that's why, so in case somebody says, well, why the hell does the guy have Mr. Sunshine Vince Gunso, like, why do I have to put his name? It's because I'm okay creating another brand called Mr. Sunshine, but I'm not letting go of the Gunso brand. I gotta so, connect to the Gunso So how, how transferable is that? You're in, you're in construction now, you're in restaurants. How transferable has the name been for you? How, how do you approach, like, because the restaurant business, you know, I don't look for the same thing there that I do in construction or in the cinema, so how do you Right, so, when, so when we opened the restaurants, we called our pizzerias Julieta Pizzeria. Sure. Okay. We had a problem with the Le Fils de la Langue Francaise. We thought that okay. we weren't respecting language laws. And so we thought, sure. He said, well, you know, Giulietta is an Italian name. It's a name. I just forget Italian. Pizzeria is, uh, you know, okay. So I was talking to one of my partners, and he says to me, you know, Vince, I was on the holidays. And we thought, uh, you know, I was away at, at Christmas. And I told somebody I was partners with you okay. in these restaurants. Okay. Oh, that's a good soul. Oh, is that with you? Yeah. Oh, so then I'm really going to try it. So it was your name that was carrying. That's right. So the click was because it's a good so managed company. Sure. It's not a regular mom and pop. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to get substandard. But so all of a sudden we resolved the problem by calling the place Julieta Pizzeria Napolitana by Good So Hospitality. Okay. okay. And because there's more French words and all of that that there are. But you also have the brand issue yes. too because you, so, have, you had your. But, but ultimately, the brand. Once you create a brand like Apple, for example, you can have an Apple Watch, you can have an Apple phone, sure. you will be able to have an Apple car. And I can guarantee you, I'm at the top of the list of buying that car. It's <laughs> that car I want. Right. And so you need to, as an entrepreneur or entrepreneur, you need to create a story, you need to create an image, you need to create a brand, and a brand is who are you, 
And that's what we look for in brackets, right? Somebody comes in, sometimes we, sometimes we, you'll see, we'll ask, tell me, what's the story behind this? Like, where, how did you come up with the idea? Sure. Because we're trying to get, how did you come up with this? Why, who sure. are you? That's what we're trying to get. And that's what has to come across through your brand. Elon Musk is a creation of today's branding tool. Back in the, the, the person, 70s. Like yeah. the person too. Probably. That's right. Back in the 70s, you would never have the founder owner of a company that no. be public. Yeah. Yeah. It was always yeah. hidden well, right? And, and, and the difference is we have become more, would you say individualistic? Well, I'll tell you something. Every moment, every time humanity advances, it is because of the selfishness of one individual who wanted to stand out of the crowd and they discovered the cure for, or you know, they discovered penicillin. They discovered every time, if you think about so, the big changes, okay. it is the selfishness of wanting to shine of one person. And then humanity takes that invention and says, wait a minute. Did we just realize that that's it? Then why is it now? No, it's just it's just not nice for us to admit it. Okay. And because it, it's, it's, it's too self-serving, right? As long as you're a, a struggling success story to be, okay. we're all rooting for it. It looks good here, okay. Yeah, the minute you've made it, now it makes me look bad. I want to ask you, so about the, the Quebec ecosystem, what do you tell students here about the option to leave or stay? Do you tell them, start something here? Um, what are the pros and cons that you've seen? Montreal. You mentioned the rent at some point, but is there anything else you think is special? Look, I'm going to Costa Rica because I have a business opportunity there. I was in Kansas City because there was a business opportunity there. That doesn't mean I hate Quebec. It doesn't mean I hate Montreal. It means, hey, sure. I, made, I, I made half a billion dollars here. Maybe I made 10 billion there. I, I'm ready to go. I, I'm ready to, you know, because that's what it is to be an entrepreneur. You're a nomad. You go where the deal goes. You go where the money is to be made, and then you can have your roots in Montreal. Right, and then you went like the child. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is great. <laughs>